Hello and welcome to another video review. This is Assassin's Creed Syndicate for PC, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4. What you're seeing here is the PC version. This is an action-adventure game, although it's arguably the most stealthy of the games in the Assassin's Creed franchise, and speaking of which, it is the ninth major entry in that series. It was developed and published by Ubisoft in 2015 for PC, Xbox One, and PS4, and while the console versions generally got a pretty decent reception, on PC their response was considerably more mixed, and I think a lot of that is due to some technical issues and performance issues that the PC version has. But regardless of which version you're talking about here, one of the biggest problems Syndicate had to overcome was the franchise fatigue which was in full effect at the time it was released. As I mentioned, it is the ninth main entry in the series, but you have to keep in mind, at the time this released, we were still getting a brand new Assassin's Creed game every single year, and it was more or less turning into the same thing over and over and over again, and it was starting to bleed together very heavily with other Ubisoft games as well. This ultimately meant that in order in order for this to really win over hearts and minds, they would need to make some significant changes and improvements to the formula that had become stale basically three or four games ago. But to make matters worse, they also had the question of whether or not this would suffer from the same issues that Unity had, where Unity was barely playable at best on launch, and over time, with patches, it became sort of playable. But even after significant patches, and even after hardware improvements, it still ran like absolute garbage, and it still had a ton of glitches to boot. So of course, the questions we'll be looking at during the course of this review are, did they actually make any significant changes to the gameplay formula of Assassin's Creed? And if so, how effective were they? And did it manage to improve upon things that Unity did poorly? Well, let's go ahead and start delving right into it and find out. And like always, we'll go ahead and start with the presentation, which runs on an updated version of the same engine that powered Assassin's Creed Unity, which is Anvil Next 2.0, and it has pretty similar visual quality to its immediate predecessor, which is really not surprising. I mean, they are only a year apart. And while the visuals do hold up pretty well for the most part, they are starting to look a bit dated in certain spots, mostly with regards to certain special effects, as well as texture quality in particular. Now, of course, you do have to keep in mind that this was before the Xbox One X and PS4 Pro came out, so they were still targeting the original version of the 8th generation consoles, just the base PS4 and the base Xbox One, and they hadn't quite learned all of the optimizations they needed to do to make it work properly on those consoles yet, but even then, they actually downgraded the visual quality down to 900p, and it still wasn't maintaining even 30 frames per second on either system. This is of course where the PC version comes into play, because the visuals are slightly upgraded compared to the console, although it's not really noticeable in the grand scheme of things. But the much more important question about the PC with regards to visuals and performance is how much better does the PC version perform? Well, it depends on what you have the settings at. And while that'll probably sound painfully obvious to any of you who are familiar with PC games, just bear with me a moment. The game does have a respectable amount of graphical options available to you, but there are three in particular that will absolutely destroy your frame rate if you're not careful. These are the anti-aliasing, the HBAO setting, and the PCSS setting. Now, I'm not really going to go into much detail on what these individual settings do, but the short version is that anti-aliasing deals with jagged edges. If you're used to seeing jagged edges in old games, that's usually because they didn't have any sort of anti-aliasing. More recent games will have anti-aliasing, and that just smooths out the edges with a lot of different techniques, each of which has its own performance impact. Then there's HBAO which is Horizon-Based Ambient Occlusion. Short version there is it's a subset of Ambient Occlusion, which is a variety of techniques that can be used to render the lighting in a way where things that are supposed to be darker are darker, whereas things that are supposed to be lighter are more well lit. And then there's PCSS, which is a specific form of shadow rendering, which is meant to make shadows much more accurate to real life with the way they disperse on the ground and such. If you want a more technical description of what those actually do look elsewhere, that's not really for the scope of this particular video, but the short version is how they affect this particular game. Which is to say, if you go into your options and you select HBAO Plus Ultra and you select PCSS Ultra, 
or you go into your anti-aliasing settings and select MSAA or TXAA with varying degrees of intensity, they will tank your frame rate. Now, if you're wondering how it might affect your particular system, I have an i7-4790K, 16 gigs of RAM, and a GTX 1080. This is by no means a weak system, although the processor in particular is starting to get a bit dated. And at 1080p, with every single setting put all the way up to the absolute maximum, including HBAO Plus Ultra, PCSS Ultra, and I usually go with TXAA with the anti-aliasing technique on that, then it ends up being in the ballpark of about 35 to 50-ish frames per second. And it fluctuates wildly. It'll be upwards of 100 in the menus when you're running around the city. It'll go all the way down into the low 30s. If you're running around in a more enclosed space, the frame rate gets much closer to 60. It is wildly inconsistent with those all set. And after doing a bit of experimentation, I ultimately ended up with FXAA for the anti-aliasing, HBAO Plus for the ambient occlusion, and PCSS for the shadow rendering. Just normal PCSS and HBAO Plus, not the ultra settings. And after doing that, my frame rate basically never drops below 60. In fact, it almost never drops below 75 at this point. It's actually kind of astounding to see how much those particular settings affect the performance. And the even weirder part is that the difference between between HBAO Plus Ultra and HBAO Plus, and of course PCSS Ultra and PCSS, is actually almost imperceptible. I could not tell a difference between the settings, I just noticed that the frame rate was a lot higher when I was using the slightly lowered settings, so I just ended up sticking with that, because frankly performance is much more important than visuals. Now the difference between FXAA and the other AA techniques on the other hand is much more noticeable, so just keep that in mind, but the short version is that I finally got settings that that make it run pretty acceptably, unlike with Assassin's Creed Unity, which ran like garbage no matter what settings you had. So despite there still being some performance and optimization issues here, this is a noticeable improvement in both performance and stability over Assassin's Creed Unity, so they definitely deserve kudos for sorting those major problems out. And while I did mention that there are certain aspects of the visuals that are starting to look a bit dated, for the most part, that doesn't really matter because the real star of the show here is the historical setting, which is rendered with excessive detail, and basically as always with Ubisoft, they really go out out of their way to make sure that the historical settings are immaculately rendered. Now, the characters, on the other hand, are a bit messier in that regard. They still look excellent, but there's certain slight oddities with facial animations here and there, as well as some being much more detailed than others in a way that is actually a bit jarring at times. But that said, the most jarring aspect of the visuals is the serious audio desync problem that occurs in all of the pre-rendered cutscenes. You see, the pre-rendered cutscenes tend to have frame rates well above 60. In fact, they tend to go well above a hundred and for whatever reason the engine just does not handle that well at all and the audio gets horribly desynchronized in those cutscenes so that is something that does become very irritating but when you get into the main game itself and are just running around doing things that actually is perfectly fine in that regard this of course leads us into the sound design which overall is very well done it's got some excellent voice acting with characters being given a fair bit of emotion here and there as well as given quite a bit of personality They've definitely done a good job with that. It also has an excellent soundtrack composed by Austin Wintory, which is very heavy on strings, which is of course appropriate for the era, and it really does help to sell the Victorian England vibe. The only part that does suffer a bit is the sound effects, which are generally very well done, it's just that the gunshots and explosions in particular just don't have a whole lot of impact behind them. They're not terrible, but they're definitely a bit on the weaker side, and that is ultimately fairly disappointing. But when you bring all the aspects of presentation together, you do end up with something that ultimately works very well and still holds up even though it is relatively early in the 8th generation of consoles. But of course, what really matter here are the story and the gameplay, and there's technically two stories in this game. The first is the meta story, which literally nobody cares about, and we were sick of it several games ago. But of course, Ubisoft just couldn't let it die, and they just kept putting it in, on up through Syndicate. And to make matters worse, this is a direct sequel to Unity in that regard, where you play as the same character that you played as in that, in the meta story anyway, looking back through the memory 
memories of the character you were actually playing as. And in this particular case, you're combing through the genetic memories of Jacob and Evie Fry, twin assassins that lived during the Victorian era, and you are ultimately trying to find clues to a piece of Eden that the Templars are trying to find in modern day. And while you're combing through these memories, the rest of your team is getting into all kinds of trouble trying to spy on the Templars and do their own thing. And like in the previous games, it is completely impossible to give one single solitary crap about anything that is going on in the present day timeline because the entire game really takes place in the past. Now, as I understand it, after this particular game, they finally learned their lesson in that regard, where nobody gives a crap about the present day timeline, so they just dropped it in the subsequent games. And to that I say, good, because all it does in the context of Syndicate and, of course, previous games as well, is just interrupt all of the interesting things that you're doing so you can go through a few cutscenes or go through some really boring gameplay segments. In this particular case, it's only cutscenes, so at least you can skip them, but it's still annoying. Now then, mini rant aside, what about the actual story of Assassin's Creed Syndicate? Not the meta story they want you to think is the story, but the actual things you were doing throughout the entire game. Well, like I said, you'll be playing as both Jacob and Evie Fry throughout the course of the game, and it chronicles their attempts at liberating London from Templar influence, because London had become an absolute stronghold of Templar presence, and after getting completely fed up with the Assassin Brotherhood's inaction in that regard, they take it upon themselves to go and liberate London, and of course take down the Templars in the process. But of course, because Ubisoft basically wrote themselves into a corner with the whole piece of Eden idea, the Templars have ultimately gotten a hold of one, and are plotting to use it to increase their power, and Evie in particular is working to try to retrieve that, or at least prevent the Templars from using it in some regard. This leads her into direct conflict with her twin brother, because he is much more concerned with starting up a gang that he calls the Rooks, and taking down the Templars in the city, and she's much more concerned with finding that piece of Eden, so they're just butting heads all the time, and eventually they decide to just go on their own separate missions whenever they're not handling something that they both agree on. This leads to a somewhat interesting mechanic where you can actually switch between both Jacob and Evie basically whenever you want, when you're wandering around the overworld and during certain missions in fact, but when you go on these story missions, more likely than not you're going to be playing as only one of them at any given time. As the story progresses, Evie continues looking for the Peace of Eden while Jacob continues to take down Templars, and eventually Evie's segments start to turn more into cleaning up Jacob's messes than anything else, because it turns out that he's not just brash and impulsive like you know from the very beginning of the game, he simply doesn't stop to consider the ramifications of his actions. As far as he's concerned, taking down Templars is a good thing, and that will ultimately result in the city being liberated from their influence, but of course reality is much more complicated than kill the bad guy, save the world, and not thinking things through can result in certain services being basically non-existent, or power vacuums existing that only cause more problems, or whatever the case may be. In fact, this brings up the fairly odd tonal issues that this game has, because throughout a lot of the missions, and a lot of especially the side content, Jacob and Evie are constantly cracking wise, it gives the impression that the game's not really meant to be taken all that seriously, and and then it goes through the main story, and you have these missions where you just go and do your thing as Jacob, and then you'll play another mission later on down the line as Evie, and the actions you took as Jacob are actually pretty negatively affecting the people of London, the very people you were trying to save in the first place. But in the same game where you have these rather serious consequences for your actions, you also have missions where you're doing things like hunting down spring Jack with Charles Dickens. It's just bizarre. And while it's not necessarily a deal breaker, it does make it hard to figure out exactly what the game is wanting you to feel at any given moment, and you'll probably just end up settling into playing the game for gameplay's sake more than anything else. That's not to say that the writing is a complete bust, I mean, occasionally the wisecracking of Jacob and Evie can be fairly amusing, and you do have some quirky characters to interact with, like Charles Dickens, and Charles Darwin, and Alexander Graham Bell, and other historical figures that Ubisoft has taken quite 
quite a few liberties with portraying, shall we say. The short version there is that they overdo it just a bit. In fact, it's just enough to where it crosses the line from the characters being quirky to them just being a bit cringe-inducing sometimes. Meanwhile, the characters you're working much more directly with that are actually constructs from Ubisoft rather than historical figures that they are adapting into their game are generally pretty decently done, although the villains can be fairly mustache-twirlingly evil, which is pretty ironic considering previous attempts in the series to try to humanize the Templars a bit and turn them into something that is not simply a mustache-twirling villain, and yet in this thing, they seem to have just thrown their hands up, said screw it, and made all of their villains completely irredeemable for the most part. So it's definitely a bit of a shame that the writing's so all over the place, but it's at least not bad enough to where it really becomes a major problem when you're actually playing. The gameplay, on the other hand, well, that's a bit of a different story. Let me go ahead and get this out of the way. If you don't like Assassin's Creed, this is not going to win you over. It's very much more of the same in most regards. It still has the free-running system that we've seen in all of the previous games. In fact, this one actually is the same one that was in Unity, but with one new addition, that being a grappling hook that you can use to very quickly scale buildings, or to actually create zip lines to quickly move between buildings, which makes the movement a lot faster compared to the previous games. And particularly in certain missions, it's pretty much vital to be able to do that, so it's definitely a great new feature. I'm very glad that they put it in there. There's still some very basic, very easy combat in there, which consists mostly of just mashing the attack button, occasionally pressing the counter button whenever somebody decides to try to hit you, and occasionally pressing another button to dodge ranged attacks or do quick shots. Of course, you have some ranged weapons of your own, most notably the throwing knives, which are quick and silent kills, especially if you get headshots, and the revolvers, or the self-loading pistol that you can get pretty much at the end of the game, which will allow you to shoot at enemies with very loud, very powerful shots. In fact, in some cases, the guns pretty much completely trivialize the combat because you can just aim for the head and get one shot off, and for most of the enemies, that's enough to take them down and send them ragdolling all over the place. But even if you decide not to use that air quotes handicap, the combat is just not all that interesting because, again, it is a very basic system that is very button mashy and ultimately kind of boring after a while because it's just so easy. They do try to introduce something vaguely resembling difficulty in that regard by putting in a leveling system where if you go into areas where you're under leveled compared to the enemies that are there, you'll do a lot less damage to them and in some cases you basically won't do any damage to them at all. And if you wander into one of those areas, that means getting out of there or actually fighting your way through it can become an exceptionally tedious slog. This is where the slightly enhanced stealth system can actually come into play because compared to previous games where there was basically no such thing as sneaking, now you can at least sneak around. You have a dedicated stealth button where you can press it and you'll just start crouching, pull up your hood, and become a lot less visible to enemies as well as moving slightly faster than just walking. When you do this, a ring will pop up around your character and will help clue you in on where enemies are and whether or not they're starting to detect you, and you'll also notice that from icons that display over them as well. And while you're sneaking around, you can get behind enemies and knock them out, or of course you can just assassinate them. You can hide bodies in various locations, like carts full of hay or in small boots that are scattered around, and of course you can hide in those yourself as well. You can whistle to lure an enemy near you and then take them out from behind cover or from within one of those hiding spots as well. And if getting close to an enemy isn't really an option, then you can opt for ranged weapons, like the throwing knives, which you can throw at the enemy's heads to instantly kill them or just do quick throws to damage them, as well as the hallucinogenic darts that you can either shoot an individual enemy with, or you can shoot to a source of flames, which will cause it to disperse into a small area around that, and it will cause enemies to go berserk and attack each other. And of course, if any of the ones that are affected by the hallucinogenic darts survive the ensuing melee, then eventually they'll just end up collapsing themselves, so it's got an added bonus there. And of course, there is also some degree of social stealth in there, which is something that the Assassin's Creed series has had from the beginning, where you can hide in crowds and things like that. And while the stealth system is extremely basic and frankly extremely easy to abuse considering how incredibly dumb the enemy AI is, they at least made some effort to actually improve it and make you feel more like, oh, I don't know, an assassin as opposed to just some dude who walks into an area and lays waste to it. Although you can certainly do that too. But you have to keep in mind that stealth is not necessarily a requirement for the vast majority of the game. It's more of an option than anything else. Sure, there are certain missions that do 
do require you to be stealthy and not get detected, but for the most part, if you decide not to be stealthy, you're certainly not punished for it, and the game pretty much supports it, considering how incredibly easy it is for the most part. I mean, sure, the arbitrary leveling system they decided to put into the game makes wandering into certain areas much more difficult than others, but as long as you're being stealthy, or as long as you just run away, it's really not that much of a problem. This, of course, does lead me into the leveling system itself and how it actually affects the gameplay. So the basic idea for this is that every thousand experience points you earn a skill point. You can put these points into a selection of skills, and when the amount of skill points you've invested hits certain milestones, then you will level up. As you continue to progress down the skill tree, the investment requirements get higher and higher. So you'll start off with skills that only require one point to get, and then you'll end up with ones that require two points, and then four points, and eventually six points. And these skills will give you various benefits, like giving you additional health, as well as damage resistance, or certain abilities that will allow your combos to be more effective, or in certain cases, enhance your stealth capabilities. And you'll notice that at the end of the skill tree, there are certain skills that are only available to either Jacob or Eevee. This is because they decided to make Jacob a more combat-oriented character, and Eevee a more stealth-oriented character, and so they have certain skills that tie into their abilities more, but again, they're at the very bottom of the skill tree, so you really won't have access to those until basically the mid to end game. The amount of experience you earn is shared across both characters, as are the amount of skill points you earn, but the skill tree investitures that you've made are not shared. So let's say you've gone through a bunch of missions and you've earned 10 skill points and you've gone ahead and invested all of them as Jacob. Well, when you go over to Eevee, you'll find that the investitures you've made as Jacob do not carry over to Eevee, but she does have 10 skill points available for you to spend on whatever skills you want for her. This does have the side effect of having each character technically being at different levels depending on how many skill points you've actually invested in them, and if you're waiting for certain skills on certain characters, but it's not really that big of a problem because ordinarily, if you're keeping up with it, you can keep everything on a pretty even keel. Now, the effects of the skills on gameplay are going to be pretty obvious, but what about the leveling system itself? Well, as you continue to level up, you'll gain access to additional equipment. Now, not all of this is stuff that you'll just be given throughout the game. You do have to craft some of it using materials that you will find scattered around the world, and some of it can can be simply bought using the in-game currency, but some of it also has very specific material requirements that you have to go on missions to get, or you have to level up your relationship with the various associates to get access to, which I'll get to that more in a moment. But there's only one other thing the leveling system does than simply blocking off content from you. It makes the enemies tougher and do more damage. In other words, the leveling system is very arbitrary and doesn't really do a whole lot to enhance the experience because it tries to block off certain areas until you've progressed further into the game, but all you have to do in that regard is just go on side activities until you've leveled up enough to be able to handle it. And to give you an idea of just how arbitrary it is, I decided to do what I normally do with Assassin's Creed, which is go around and explore the world and find all the viewpoints so I can fill in the map. In doing that, I ended up finding all the different activities for Burrow Liberation, and I decided to go ahead and do all of those. And while at first I did stick to the low-level areas just to get a feel for how the game worked and get through a couple of quick burrow liberations, I ended up having to go into the higher level areas eventually, even though I was pretty underleveled for it, and it didn't really matter all that much. Sure, the hallucinogenic dart doesn't work on higher-leveled characters until you get upgrades later on, and it forced me to use stealth a lot more, but it was never really much of a challenge even with that. And by the time I got back on track to completing the story, it was the beginning of sequence 4, which is basically when the game sets you loose into London in the first place, and I had already liberated all of the burrows, as well as gotten myself up to about level 7, meaning that for the story stuff, I was hilariously overleveled. So in short, the leveling system is meant to try to balance out the gameplay a bit, but it ends up failing miserably in that regard. 
Now, of course, for the most part, everything I've been talking about up to this point has been fairly par for the course for Assassin's Creed. Sure, with some slight tweaks here and there, but nothing all that unusual. But where things do start to get different are in the liberation mechanics as well as the gang mechanics. Now, the basic premise behind this is that the Templars have backed a gang called the Blighters, which have basically taken over London, and Jacob sees an opportunity to create a gang he calls the Rooks and take back London from the Blighters with his own gang. And the way you'll go about doing this is going through a series of activities that have you hunting down Templars as well as abducting specific individuals that are vital for the Blighter's cause, and of course disrupting their work operations. After you complete enough of these activities in a given borough, it unlocks the Gang War, where the leader of the gang in that particular region will reveal themselves to you, and you'll have the opportunity to take them out quickly and reduce their leadership during the ensuing Gang War, or if they may manage to get away, you'll have to fight them during the gang war event. But that's basically a combat event where your gang goes up against the blighters, and if you win, then you manage to liberate the burrow and it falls under your control. Completing the various activities as well as liberating burrows not only reduces the blighter presence in the city, meaning you're not going to be forced into combat as much, but it also gives you additional resources and additional income, so you can continue to spend money on upgrades and such like that at a pretty rapid pace. These upgrades will give you access to things like additional gang member types that have specializations, as well as just increasing the combat effectiveness of gang members in general, or give you discounts in the various shops for when you're replenishing all of your equipment and ammunition, or reducing the combat effectiveness of the Blighters and eventually the Templars, or even creating additional opportunities for mayhem by giving you access to a lot more crates of dynamite scattered around the areas, or optional barrels that you can drop on enemies, or things like that. The thing is, the gang upgrades really aren't all that necessary because you can basically do everything yourself, and in fact, the friendly AI is dumb enough that it gets in your way more often than not. Sure, upgrading your gang members' combat effectiveness is handy during the gang war sections, but other than that, it's not really all that useful because they basically can't keep up with you. So even though you can go to any of your gang members and just recruit them to follow you around, it's usually not all that useful, and you find that you'll just go off and do your own thing thing more often than not. So a feature that they tried to make a core part of the game, the entire idea of becoming a syndicate and having your gang to support you, is really more of a bust than anything else. I mean, sure, you do get the mobile headquarters, that being the train, but that just basically gives you a mobile fast travel point that you can go to on occasion, and you can retrieve your income there, but other than that, the train is fairly pointless. And aside from just going through the various liberation activities to level yourself up so you can actually handle things later on, the only other major benefit for completing these various activities is that you'll earn favor for completing different activities with the various associates that you have, and as you continue to earn favor and level up that favor, you'll gradually gain access to additional equipment as well as new crafting recipes to create upgrades for your gear and such like that, as well as occasionally getting customization items or special materials that you can use to craft things later on. But the major problem with all of these activities is not just how repetitive they get because you're doing the same thing over and over and over again with barely any variation between the various areas that you're doing them in, but rather that some of them are just downright annoying like the abduction missions where you have to grab somebody and extract them from an area, throw them into a carriage, and then drive that carriage over to a drop-off point only to be assailed during the process by being run down by other carriages, and the carriage-on-carriage -carriage combat is pretty obnoxious, I have to say. But it gets even more more obnoxious if you're trying to do one particular activity and you happen to wander into an area that actually activates another activity because they can go on top of each other for some utterly baffling reason. Sure, you can just ignore the other one and continue doing whatever it was you were already doing, but you shouldn't have to worry about another activity triggering right in the middle of when you're already in one. So the activities are implemented in a fairly messy way and they also end up becoming repetitive over time, so the the open world gameplay in this just ends up not being realized all that well, which is really not surprising. It's been a problem that the Assassin's Creed series has struggled with for a long time. 
But even the main missions aren't all that special. I mean, sure, they do spice things up a bit more than the activities do, but you're still doing a lot of the same kind of things you were doing in previous Assassin's Creed games and frankly got tired of in those other games. Especially things like the tailing missions, which have always been among the most boring missions that they could possibly throw into these games, but the series, for some utterly baffling reason, seems to absolutely love them. And when you bring it all together, you find that they couldn't really avoid the franchise fatigue. I mean, sure, people who were already fans of Assassin's Creed would probably enjoy Syndicate, but for everybody else, it doesn't do anything you haven't seen before in plenty of other action-adventure games. Sure, it's an improvement over Unity, but that's really not saying much. Unity on launch was almost unplayable, and even after very heavy patching, it's still barely playable to this day. Syndicate, on the other hand, is certainly very playable, but there's not really much reason to unless you're just a big fan of the Assassin's Creed series and you just want more of that. I certainly wouldn't go so far as to say it's an outright bad game. I mean, like I said, it's playable, it has its moments occasionally, but for the most part, it's just fairly bland and tedious. And no amount of impressive recreation of Victorian London can save it from the fact that, as a game, it's just very mediocre overall. Ultimately, that puts it at a 2.5 out of 5 on my scale. Again, it's not an outright bad game, but it's very mediocre, and the only people who are really going to be able to get much out of it are existing fans of the Assassin's Creed series. And the saddest part of all of this is that Assassin's Creed Syndicate showed signs of them actually learning from some of their mistakes and trying to make the game a bit more stealth-oriented and make it feel more like you're an actual assassin than just an action-adventure game hero. And instead of taking those elements and improving upon those and just taking their time with it, they decided to go a completely different direction with Assassin's Creed Origins and basically turned the series into Ubisoft's generic historical action-adventure franchise. And now that we've had three games of that particular style with Assassin's Creed Origins, then Odyssey, and the upcoming Valhalla, it's hard to say if they're ever going to actually return to a proper Assassin's style Assassin's Creed. But as it stands, Ubisoft basically ran that into the ground with yearly releases until you finally got to Syndicate and it just went out with a whimper. And it's just a real shame to see that everything that Ubisoft has been putting out has been turning into one homogenous blob of Ubisoft game. So who knows where things will go in the future, but as far as I'm concerned, at least so far, the Assassin's Creed series died with Syndicate and it turned into something completely different from then on out. Thank you all very much for watching, and if you like the kind of videos I make, then please consider supporting the channel on Patreon. Every single cent I get from that goes directly back into the channel in some regard, whether that be getting additional equipment or additional games for review or whatever the case may be. If you can't afford to or don't want to, that's perfectly fine, I understand, but the option is there if you're interested. Thank you all again for watching, and I'll see you all in later videos.